Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for him that is at work within us. Thank you that we're not alone. And you, you are with us. Father, as we continue to press into you, our heart's desire is that we may come to the fullness of the measure, of the stature, of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says we are epistles known and read of all men. We are probably the Bibles that this world will not read. Therefore, Father, we ask that you will mold us and you will shape us and you will let your light and your glory reflect in our lives so that without a word, people can be drawn to the beauty of the person of Jesus Christ. You said in the word that you did not come into this world to condemn anyone, but that through you they might be saved. Father, our hearts cry this morning is for the salvation of our loved ones, the salvation of our family members. We promise that you will save us and our entire household. Lord, we make a demand on the power that's in that word, that you will begin to touch members of our families who don't know you or who knew you and have walked away from you. Draw them by your spirit. Show them that the life they're looking for can only be found in you because you are the fountain of life. As we go into your word today to complete our study on the gifts that you have so graciously given to the body of Christ, help us, O oh God, give us an understanding heart and help us to begin to walk in the revelation of the knowledge that these 34 spiritual gifts are ours for the asking. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. <clears throat> yesterday, I've posted the, uh, the teaching uh, yesterday. Uh, it was done in my car because for some strange reason, the Wi-Fi in my son's home um, uh, went off. And you know how they give you an open appointment from 9 till 2 p.m. We didn't know when they were going to come. So I had to drive out to um, find a spot where I could park and, and, uh, and minister. So you, you'll see the video. I was sitting in my car. And the quality wasn't the greatest. But for those who were present, you will be able to figure out some of the places that were slurred. Uh, and I guess that was because I was, um, I was using cellular data rather than Wi-Fi. But it's clear enough for people who are not in the meeting to, to understand. We talked about the eight gifts from God the Father, Romans chapter 12, from verses 3 to 8. Uh, the gifts from God the Son, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, from verses verse 7, 11, I think, through 13 or 14. And then the gifts from the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, from verses 1 all the way to verse 11. Now, all of those gifts are ours. The rest of the gifts that we're going to talk about, I labeled them general gifts. Um, and I'm going to need someone to help me to um, remember them, because they are in my phone because we're having this Zoom, uh, the Zoom on my phone, it's kind of hard for me to, uh, to leave the platform of Zoom <laughs> to look for it. I, I know I have notes somewhere, but guys, my, my home is just being put together. And then on top of that, I'm traveling and I'm trying to pack to make sure that I, I don't leave anything behind. So if someone would please help me by prompting me with the gifts, then we can talk about them. Is it possible? I'm gonna mute you.
but I'm going to ask that you please mute your microphones. Everyone, please mute your microphones. Okay. The first one is health. All right, health. The second one is administration. Let, let's do it. Oh, let, me, let, me, let me take some quick notes. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, Suma, go ahead. Helps. Helps. Number two, administration. Uh -huh. Number three, voluntary poverty, like Mother Teresa. Number four, Matagram. Can you please mute your microphones? Yeah. Number four is Matagram. Mm -hmm. Number five is Kelly Basie. Number six, hospitality. Number seven, missions. Number eight, intercessions. Number nine, deliverance. Number 10, craftsmanship. 11, events. And 12, after deliverance is craftsmanship. Yeah. Inventions and music. Okay. Let me be sure I have all of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Twelve of them? Yes, twelve of them. Yeah. All right, let's let's talk about those this one so that you know. These I have classified as general gifts because these are gifts that we have um, seen in the lives of people. And obviously we know that gifts come from God. All right, no one is born with it. It's something that God gives us. We may be wired to be able to operate in some gifts better than others, but nobody's born with a particular gift. Uh, one of the things I like to also talk about in, in dealing with gifts is the personality types. Now, psychologists have done all kinds of uh, tests and analysis of, of the mind. And the last that I read, uh, there's 64 varying shades of human personality. But no matter how many they're able to identify, two broad categories would be the extrovert and the introvert. Okay? Every other thing is varying shades of, of those two broad categories. And uh, I've also read a good book that I would like to recommend at this point. It's called The Spirit-Controlled Temperament. The Spirit-Controlled Temperament by a gentleman by the name of Tim LaHaye. Tim, T-I-M, LaHaye. Capital L, small a, capital H-A-Y-E. Tim LaHaye, The Spirit-Controlled Temperament. Him and his wife are great authors. They've written several books. But if you want to understand your personality type that would be a great book to read it's written from the standpoint of scriptures by by this gentleman who is a believer so um it, it, <clears throat> of course the gifts that god has given us have to do with our personalities all right and like i said the two broad categories that we have in human personalities are the introvert and the extrovert and then further breakdown of those two uh, is in the introvert two types, in the extrovert two types. And I know some of you may have read about it. Uh, they use colors, red, blue, yellow, and green or whatever. I don't use colors. I am never able to remember what color is for who. <clears throat> I prefer the way Tim LaHaye explains it in his book. Uh, you have type A, the extrovert, you have <clears throat> the choleric, and there's, there's one other word that he uses, um, which, is really, which is really, really uh, uh, odd, sanguine. because that's, that's my personality type, the sanguine, all right? And then for the introvert, you have the phlegmatic, and you have the melancholic, all right? I don't know why he uses the word melancholic, but it really doesn't mean that the person is melancholic. Um, 
For the extrovert, you have the sanguine and then you have the choleric. The sanguine is that individual that is completely extroverted. They, they, they are the live wire of the party. They are the great conversationalists. They are the ones who make friends in a heartbeat. <clears throat> and those are the positive uh, uh, things about this personality type. But they, they are also a little bit of a scatterbrain. Because in being so outgoing and being so accommodating and being so friendly, they are not as organized as they should be. All right, so a, a sanguine will tell uh, Sister Sumba, I will see you at three o'clock. Tell me, oh, I'll be there at 3.30. And tell somebody else, I, I should be there at four. Four is good. You know, not, not thinking about travel time, <clears throat> not thinking about when you do get to me, the time that we're going to spend to talk about whatever it is we we're supposed to be meeting for. And so they are pretty much a scatterbrain. Um, they're the type that speaks uh, before they think seriously about what they're about to say. Peter, <clears throat> one of the disciples of Jesus Christ, is a classic example of a sanguine. Peter would often speak before thinking. At the Mount of Transfiguration, when they saw Jesus transfigured and they saw him in his glory as God, as deity, the Bible says his raiment even changed, not just the glory of his person, even the garment he had on. He had this meeting with Moses and Elijah. And Peter was like, you know what, Jesus? Let's just stay here. Let this Mount of Transfiguration, this is it. We will build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. As for me and uh, James and John, don't, don't worry about us. We'll sleep. We'll sleep under the skies. We'll be fine. Let's just stay here. Well, the trouble with what Peter was saying to Jesus was, this is a great mountain. Let's be here. This is where we saw you in all of your glory and your splendor and the pomp and the pageantry of who you are as God Almighty. But he forgot a greater mountain called Calvary. Because if Jesus would have tarried at transfiguration and not gone on to Calvary, where would you and I be today? That's why the Mount of Calvary is, is greater than the Mount of Transfiguration. And you know, God gave me a revelation a few years ago, and, and this is going off on a tangent, but I need to let you know. Because of the prosperity message that's <clears throat> in the church, and there's nothing wrong with the prosperity message. God wants us to prosper. There's no question about that. But polarization of any one part of the Bible is a problem. When you, when you overextend any, any grace or any gift, it can become a problem. So for example, if you are, if you are sanguine and you are, you, are, <clears throat> um, you are so outgoing and you're so, so vocal and all the rest of it, you might tend to get on people's nerves, you know? Well, that's your personality. That's who you are. God can use you uh, if you're like that. I'm not saying this so that you uh, beat down on yourself, if, that, if that's who you are. But you need to know the strengths and the weaknesses of your personality type so that the gift of God can work accurately and adequately in you. So if you're a sanguine, you need to have some reins, R-E-I-N-S, some reins that you can like tell the horse, oh, slow down. Okay, um, so <clears throat> while it is good to know what the personality types are uh, and, and, and the advantages, we also need to know what the disadvantages and what the drawbacks are. So as a sanguine, God can use you. God used Peter. God made Peter the, the head of the disciples, so to say. And I was sharing the revelation that God gave me. I said, because of transfiguration and everything Peter saw there, he didn't want to go to Calvary. And the parallel God drew for me with the teaching on prosperity is because pastors have, have, have been taught by the Spirit of God about prosperity and how the God wanted the church to know that God desires for us to be prosperous so that we can be effective uh, in our Christian life and our Christian walk. Pastors have camped at the Mount of transfiguration, the Mount of Prosperity. They've camped there and they don't want to leave there. You're teaching people about prosperity, but you're not teaching them about character. You're not teaching them about godliness. 
You're not teaching them about holiness. And prosperity without all of these things is extremely dangerous. If you don't have the character to be able to curb vices and to be able to curb the downside of your personality, having money will just enlarge that. And pastors have camped at prosperity, forgetting Calvary. Because God's heart at the end of the day is not so much your prosperity, it is Calvary. The reason why he will give you prosperity is because of Calvary. The reason why God will put money in your hand is so that the gospel can be preached and so that souls can be saved. So money and prosperity is a means to an end. It's not the end of it. It's not so that I can buy the big and luxurious cars and go on cruises and go on trips and, and live in a, in, a, in a 10 bedroom mansion like some of these pastors. How many bedrooms are you going to sleep in? It's just waste as far as I'm concerned. But that's neither here nor there. So pastors have camped at Mount Transfiguration and they have refused to move on to Calvary. Well, the reason why God gives us money is so that this gospel can be preached. All right? So Peter would often speak. He said, Jesus, let's stay here. Forgetting Calvary. All right? When Jesus asked, whom do men say that I am? I think that's in Matthew 16. Either Matthew 16 or Matthew 18. Whom do men say that I am? And they said, well, some said you're Elijah. Some said you're Moses. Some said this. And Jesus said, all right, you guys. You guys that are with me, that, that live with me, walk with me, work with me. Who do you say that I am? Peter received a revelation from the Holy Spirit, from God the Father. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus Christ said, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father who is in heaven. How did Peter move from receiving such a profound revelation from God to Jesus, don't go to Jerusalem? Because he turned around and said to Jesus a little later on, don't go to Jerusalem. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. All right, because Jesus recognized that it wasn't Peter speaking, it was the devil speaking through him that didn't want Jesus to go on to Calvary, to go on to Jerusalem, to go through the, the passion, his, his arrest, his false accusation, his, 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 his mockery of a trial, his condemnation, his crucifixion, and his glorious re resurrection. All of that would not have happened if he listened to Peter and said, you know what, it's true. Those guys are uh, out to get me. Let's, let's, go to, let's go to Nazareth. Let's go somewhere else. See? So praise God. We need to understand the personality types. That's the sanguine. The choleric is an outgoing person as well. It's an extrovert. And that's my personality type. And like I told you with the gifts, it's the same thing with the personality type. There's no one that's a clear sanguine and a clear melancholic or a clear phlegmatic or a clear choleric you will have a little bit of this and a little bit of that i am i am predominantly choleric and melancholic all right and that helps me to understand who i am why i think the way i think why i act the way i act how the gifts of god work in me and can work work through me so it's good for you to get that book and do a, a personality uh self-analysis so that you can understand yourself better all right the book again is called the Spirit Controlled Temperament by Tim LaHaye. The next type of extrovert is the, is the choleric, like I said. They're outgoing, they are friendly. Uh, drop me in a city where I don't know anyone. By close of day, I've made 10, 15, 20 friends. All right? Um, they, are, they are organized, they're detailed. The part that the sanguine doesn't have, the choleric has it. All right? Now, for the introvert, you have the melancholic. That's the creative person. That's the musician. That's the artist. That's the poet. They are reserved. <clears throat> they, they don't, they don't uh, project themselves. But if you call on them and they have to do something, they do it excellently well because of the creativity that they have and because of the, of the steadiness of, of this personality type. They're thinkers. They're deep. Um, but they're not, they're not dark, if you understand what I mean. Um, that's that's the, uh, the type A of the introvert. The type B of the extrovert, of the introvert, is the phlegmatic. All right? The phlegmatic is, is even killed. He's just like that. 
He's happy, you don't know. He's sad, you don't know. He just made a million, you don't know. He's broke, you don't know. They're just very calm. They will not project themselves. They will not volunteer to do anything. But if called upon or if push comes to shove, they can actually step up and lead. But they will not offer to. These kind of people like to work in the backgrounds. In the background of, of, of anything, you want to uh, uh, stage a, produ a production, a phlegmatic will work beautifully in the background. They don't need a team. They can work by themselves. All right? So it's good for you to know who you are. Jesus Christ's disciples all had different personalities, and Jesus knew them for who they were. All right? We just spoke about Peter. Peter is a classic sanguine. Uh, take someone like James. James is, is a, a bit of a, a, a choleric and a sanguine. James, if you read James's epistles, James doesn't have time for nonsense. You know, he's like, are you, are you crazy? Okay, can't you see what God has to say? This is it, do it. That's James. Unlike a, a, a disciple like, like John. John, he was young. Yes, he was the youngest of the disciples. History tells us. But John was a loving and a gentle, melancholic type of person. Beloved, let us love, you know. Love is of God. And he who does not love is not of God. He's almost begging that we do what the word says. All right. Um, Andrew was a very observant individual. I would say he's an introvert, but very observant. Jesus was followed uh, characteristically by 4,000, 5,000 strong people whenever he, he moved around. And the miracle of the five loaves and two fishes was possible because someone like Andrew was amongst the disciples. He was the one in that throng who noticed a little boy with a lunch basket of five loaves and two fishes. And bless God for the mother of that child because she actually is the catalyst for that miracle. If she wasn't mindful to pack a little lunchbox for her boy, who says, Ma, I need to go listen to that teacher. He's going to be uh, someplace today. And she packed a little lunchbox for her son. If she hadn't done that, Jesus would not have had a seed from which 5,000 were fed. But Andrew was the observant disciple who saw it. All right, so I, I would put Andrew at a little bit of a melancholic uh, in terms of his personality type and a little bit of a choleric because he, he, he was detailed and he was organized. So Jesus' disciples had personalities. Uh, Judas Iscariot was a thief. So that should tell you the kind of person he was. All right, there were bench warmers. There were those that they were just mentioned by name once and not once after that where they referred to. Um, Matthew was a tax collector. He was an accountant, so he must have had a detailed mind, all right? So these things are real, and they're in the Bible, and you need to know who you are and how God has wired you, because that will help you to identify the gifts. We're not studying this because I'm jobless, I don't have anything to do. No, we're studying it because I want you to know, and I want you to begin to search and to look at yourself and find out what your gifts are, because your gifts, I'm going to post a 12 minute video by one of my mentors, someone whom I, I've never met him, but I mentored through his books and through his videos. And, and I listen to him a lot. I'm gonna post something that he, that he uh, put on, 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 on YouTube for you to go and watch. It will help you with what we're studying today. All right? Your personality type and your gifts work in tandem. Your personality, your gifts, work in tandem. And if you watch this 12 minute video, it will drive home the import of what it is I'm trying to get across to you this morning. So having said that, let's look at the other um, 12 uh, gifts, the general gifts. Helps is the gifts uh, that is generally, the, the name that's generally used for the gift of those who help a pastor in the church, all right? God calls a man. God never calls a committee. He calls one man, but then he sends helpers to that man. And I use the word man in a generic sense. 
because he calls women too. So he, he sends people to help the vision that he has given that man. All right. I'm called to teach. And I excel and function best in that area of calling. But in order for us to have a fellowship that's going to be vibrant and that's going to move forward beyond us just getting together one hour, one and a half hours every morning, help us have to come on board. Some of you are gifted when it comes to technology. It's, it's not a thing for my generation. I struggle with it. Okay, some of you are gifted. All of our recordings and our teachings are on Zoom. We have no control over it. If Zoom shuts down, that's it. We've lost everything that I've been teaching and everything that we've been recording. Some of you know how we can get it off of Zoom and you need to step up and help. Some of you know how we can uh, get on the internet. So, uh, uh, some of you know how we can, I don't even know what to say because it's not my area, but you know what you can do with this information that we're recording so that we can preserve it. All right. I have no intention of selling the things that I teach. None whatsoever. Okay. If we're going to charge for it, we'll, it will probably be because we have put it on a medium that costs us money to buy. And even then, how much, is a, how much is a flash drive? How much is an MP3 uh, player for us to, to charge people to receive the work? But some of you need to step up. If, if we need to have a website, somebody needs to step up. If we need to go on YouTube, somebody needs to step up. Somebody needs to manage this thing that we're doing because I don't know how to. All right, but I know what I know. I know the word. And I can run my life based on what I know and the help of the Holy Spirit. So in church, you have people who are in the counseling department. You have people who are in the accounts department. You have people who are in the children's church. You have people who are in the music ministry. You have people who are in evangelism. You have people who are in the prayer ministry. Although I don't believe in the prayer department and the evangelism department. I don't believe in it. When I pastored churches, I didn't have a prayer department and I did not have an evangelism department. Why? Because I believe every child of God is called to pray and every child of God is called to do the work of an evangelist. Paul said to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Yes, I know you're a pastor, but do the work of an evangelist because we all must share the gospel. The office of an evangelist, like I told you yesterday, is Jesus who appoints people into that office. You can't wake up, pick up a Bible and say, I'm, I'm evangelist more. No. Jesus has to appoint you because there are gifts that follow that particular office. But we can do the work of the evangelist to the extent that we can share the gospel with our family members and with our friends. Okay. So um, trying to get back to my, 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 yes, I said the people who assist the pastor for the vision that God has given him or her to come to pass is what the Bible calls helps and administration. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, Paul mentions, mentions it, and let's go there so that I can show it to you. Praise God, 1 Corinthians 12. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, look at verse uh, 27. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God had set some in the church. First, apostles. Secondarily, prophets. I told you why they are called number one and number two. Ephesians chapter two, verses 19, and I think 20 tells us that they are the foundation. And it's God who sets them. They are not ordained. Pastors and bishops and people who are ordaining apostles and ordaining prophets are wrong. It's God who calls into those offices and it's God who sets them. It's God who appoints them. You can, you can ordain a man or a woman to become a pastor. All right. They've been through a course of study and they have shown that they are called in that area. You've seen the gifts. 
you've proven it, they've worked with you, then you can ordain them to be a pastor so that the, the transfer of the grace on you that is their pastor can come upon them. But when it comes to the apostle and the prophet, God appoints, God sets. All right? So verse 29, verse 28, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that, miracles. Now, that scripture, please listen to me carefully because this is confusing to a lot of people. You will not find this in any book. All right? This is revelation from the Spirit of God. Rather than mention the office of an evangelist, Paul mentions the gift that follows the office of an evangelist in this particular verse. So he's referring to Ephesians chapter 4 that we read about, the five gifts from Jesus Christ to the church, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. When Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, he mentions the office, the apostle. He mentions the office, the prophet. Rather than mention the office of the evangelist, he says miracles. Because that's the gift that follows the office of the evangelist. After the evangelist has opened up her big mouth to say Jesus can open blind eyes, Jesus can, can, can heal the lame, Jesus can do this, Jesus can do that, God has to follow his word, her word, her preaching with signs following. So miracles follow the office of an evangelist in particular. Although in a pastor, God can allow the gift of miracles to function. But it's a particular gift that follows the office of an evangelist. I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. So verse 28, God has set some in the church, first apostles, the office, secondarily prophets, the, of the office, Th thirdly teachers, the office. After that, miracles, the gifts that follows the office of the evangelist. Then gifts of healings, the gift that follows the office of the pastor or the evangelist. Helps, gifts that follow the office of the pastor. Governments, which is administration, gifts that follow the office of the pastor. Diversities of tongues, gifts that you see in the church when we're gathered together and we speak in tongues and we pray in tongues. That's the meaning of that verse 28. It's a direct corollary to Ephesians chapter 4, verse whatever that verse is, that talks about the fivefold gifts that Jesus Christ gave to the church. Let me look for it. It's verse 11, Ephesians 4, 11. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 is a direct corollary of Ephesians 4, 11. So helps are those of you who know about building websites, those of you who know about uh, uh, YouTube and all of those things so that we can preserve our teachings, all right? You guys need it more than I do. That's the truth and that's not being boastful because I have paid the price over the years to read my Bible and to study my Bible and to memorize the things that I know. You've got to pay the price too. If you spend the time to study the word and read the word and read the books and, and, and hunger after, after the knowledge and, and memorize and do all of the things that time has allowed me to do, then maybe you don't need the recordings. Okay? But you guys have got to step up. And let's start to bring some administration, some government into this fellowship. I cannot do it alone. I tell you all the time. And you don't know for how long you have me. That's the truth. You don't know for how long this assignment is. I don't even know. God may move me tomorrow to something else. Praise God. And that's why I labor. As much as I labor, Paul said, I labor till Christ be formed in you. I want you guys to know even more than I know. Okay? So that's helped. Next is administration, same thing. Uh, some of you are born administrators. You are organizers. I've spoken about us having a, 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 some kind of an event where all of us can come together and meet each other. I don't, I don't know some of you. I've never hugged some of you. Um, 
I just see your image on Zoom. I don't know you. I, I, I try my best to pray. And I know that in the place of prayer, God can have my spirit zero in on issues going on in your life so that I can pray effectively. But I don't know your wives. I don't know your husbands. I don't know your children. I don't, I don't know where you live. You've never visited me. You don't know my children. You, you don't know where I live. We have to have an event where we can come together uh, and we plan towards it because I know it's gonna cost money to fly to wherever it is. It's gonna cost money to stay in a hotel. Even if it's a one day event so that we can come together and we can love uh, on each other and we can get to know each other be better and we can truly say we are a fellowship because we know one another, okay? Diversities of, uh, 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 of tongue, sorry. All right, so that's administration. You find that uh, uh, in the church. Voluntary poverty is a gift from God. And I put an example in, in, in the post that I put um, on the chat group. Someone like Mother Teresa, who left the comforts of a, a home, a middle-class home nonetheless, in, in Europe, and moved to India and lived in India amongst the poor and became as one of them and did tremendous work amongst them. John Wesley is also said to have been gifted with voluntary poverty. It is estimated that in his lifetime, he gave an equivalent of about a million dollars to the gospel and the preaching of the word. But when he died, all he left was what the author of the book that I read, uh, what he describes as a well-worn coat and one silver spoon. That's all he left because everything he had, he put into the preaching of the gospel. So there are some people who will go into voluntary poverty to be able to live in the midst of the people that they serve uh, on the behalf of God and, and, and the gospel, okay? Martyrdom is another gift. There are some people who will die for the sake of the gospel. They will risk their lives to go to countries where they know if they're caught, they will be beheaded. But that is not a deterrent. They will still go because they have a heart to preach the gospel to all those unreachable or unreached places of the earth. It's a gift from God. All right? And God has a way of preserving their lives until the fullness of their ministry is done. Many times they tried to kill Paul. Paul was let down uh, in a basket so that he could escape. They were coming after him and they let him down through the, uh, over the city wall in a basket. But Paul said, oftentimes I was shipwrecked. Many times I was, I was incarcerated. Many times I was flogged publicly for the sake of the gospel. He said, many times I was in want. Many times I was in fastings. So fastings were a deliberate a decision to abstain from food. But in want means he didn't have food. He didn't have money to buy food. Okay? So these are spiritual gifts because God empowers some people to be able to do it. Uh, celibacy is also a gift. Paul was married. We know that because traditionally you couldn't be a Pharisee without being married. But his wife is really never mentioned, so we presume that she must have died, and then he devoted his life. After his encounter on the way to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, he devoted the, right, the rest of his life to, to serving the Lord, and he lived a celibate life. It has to be a gift. If it's not a gift, it will be abused. That's why we read of uh, priests in the Catholic Church who are either homosexuals, or who are abusing young boys that are servers in the church. I'm not saying it to knock them. My heart goes out to them because it's a huge struggle to want to serve God and to also have this other side that is pulling them in that direction. It is because they don't have that gift of celibacy. If you have the gift of celibacy, sex will not be a challenge to you at all. The feeling will come, you will know exactly what to do with it, and you'll hang it. You suspend it, okay? So it's a gift. Hospitality is also a gift. Martha, and you will hear messages of people knocking Martha and people uh, praising uh, um, and Mary, her sister. 
Because Jesus said, Mary has chosen the better thing. She's chosen to sit at my feet and listen to me. You are cumbered about so many things. This was Jesus' rebuke to Martha because Martha complained. Please understand that. It was because Martha complained. I think it's in Luke. No, not Luke. It's in John. Probably John chapter 11. Somebody look it up for me. The story of uh, Martha and, and Mary. Right? It's because Martha went to complain to Jesus that Jesus rebuked her. She went to Jesus and he said, Jesus, my sister has left me to take care of, of these people. Listen, 5,000 people followed Jesus around and they showed up in your home. Somebody had to look after them. Somebody had to give them water to wash their dusty feet. Somebody had to give them water to quench their thirst. Somebody had to make sure there was, there was, there was room for them to sit. Jesus' meetings were packed. I remember the four guys who wanted to help their lame friend. They could not get into the house. The Bible says they had to climb the roof and open the, the roof to let their friend down on a mat uh, uh, before, before Jesus Christ so that Jesus could heal the young man. His meetings were packed. So Martha had to look after the people. So Jesus rebuked her, not for her hospitality, but for her complaints. Let's not get it twisted. Jesus said, you're encumbered about too many things. Mary has chosen the better, and it's not going to be taken away from her. But Jesus knew that she was, she was, she was an asset. If you go and read the account of Lazarus' death, all right, Jesus was told your friend is sick and nigh unto dying. Jesus packs a bag and he travels. I mean, think about it. It's like when in, in Matthew chapter 5, the Bible says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. Why would Jesus climb up into a mountain? He saw the multitude. They were gathered. The logical thing to do was to make a makeshift pulpit and preach to the people, teach the people. But he climbed the mountain. It was because he wanted to sift. He wanted to know who was a disciple. The Bible said when he was set, his disciples came after him. At risk of limb and at risk of life, they climbed up the mountain, not a, not a hill, a mountain, because they wanted to hear what the master had to say. Same thing, Jesus, your friend is ill and is near death. Jesus packs a bag and travels. And then three days later, or four days later, he says to his disciples, let's go and wake Lazarus up because he's asleep. Okay? Somebody had to do that. And if you go and read that account, when Mary saw Jesus, Mary rebuked Jesus. Mary did not display the character and the faith that Martha displayed. Martha said, well, I know that you are the resurrection and, and, and the life. And, and later on, um, my, my brother will, will, will be resurrected. And Jesus said, no, right now, I am the resurrection and the life. Let's go to his tomb. I'm getting ready to wake him up. Martha displayed more spiritual maturity than Mary because Mary was complaining about the fact that Jesus didn't come. Uh, and if you had come, my, my brother would not have died. Martha said something similar, but then she said, I know that you are the resurrection and the life. So hospitality is good. Jesus didn't rebuke Mary, uh, Martha for her hospitality. He rebukes her for her complaining. All right? It's a gift. There are some of you, you're very hospitable. People come into your homes. You open up your homes to receive people. You, you cook. You, you entertain. Uh, some of you have opened up your homes for me to come and minister. There was a family in uh, Bender's uh, Landing. Uh, two Saturdays ago, they opened up their be beautiful home. Beautiful home. And they opened up their pool for us to get people baptized in. And I am praying for that family that God who borrowed Peter's boat to preach and then gave them a net breaking load of fish will so bless that family they will not know what hit them. Hospitality is a spiritual gift. Okay? Um, the next one is missions. Some people are called to missions. I can go to missions because I am an adventurous person by nature. But can I survive in missions? I doubt it having to sleep in some places, 
having to eat what they eat because this is what missionaries do. I have a missionary friend here in Houston who went to a village. Uh, uh, I'm not going to mention the country, but he went to this village and the delicacy they put in front of him was lizards. That was the delicacy that you give to esteemed visitors, lizards. I don't know what kind of lizard it, it, it was, but a lizard, and he said they had roasted it and they had peppered it and they had it in steaks like, like shish kebab. And he said he sat down, <laughs> he sat down and he looked at the place said before him and he said in silent prayer to God, he said, well, Lord, he said, I should eat whatever I said before me. I, I bless this and I eat it. The, the, the chief of the little village where they were going to preach the gospel picked up one of the uh, kebabs, the, the lizard kebabs, broke off the head and tossed it in his mouth. And so he took, picked, up the, <laughs> picked up the kebab, broke the head off and tossed it in his mouth and crunched it. Can I do that? I think not. But some people are called to do it. It's a gift. They will go to the uttermost parts of the earth just to preach the gospel. And might I add, the reason why Jesus hasn't come back is because not everyone has heard the gospel. It's the only reason why he hasn't come back. So we're the ones delaying him. The Bible says, and this gospel shall be preached to the end of the earth. Somebody looked that scripture up for me and put it up. And this gospel shall be preached to the ends of the earth, and then the end shall come. The end will not come until everyone has had the opportunity to hear, because God has to be a righteous judge. If anybody can stand before God and say to God, I did not hear the gospel, then God has no right to judge that person. So God is waiting for us to take this gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. Okay, if Coke is in some places where it is said to be in, it's a shame on the church that the gospel is not there. We need to market, in quotes, the gospel so that everybody has the opportunity to hear so that Jesus Christ can come back. Of the 26 prophecies in the Bible, 26 direct prophecies in the Bible pointing to the second coming of Jesus, 25 have been fulfilled. Only one is left. So his coming is imminent, and it's the church that's holding him back. Let's go out and preach the gospel. The worst that you will hear is a no. It's like network marketing. Jesus is the greatest net network marketer there was because he started with 12 men, and God knows how many billions of Christians we have in the world today. Praise God. Intercession. Intercession is one of the nine types of prayers that I have taught before. And if you were not in this fellowship when I taught it, you can reach out to me one-on-one. -on -one. There are nine different kinds of prayers that we see in the Bible with the scriptures that govern them. Intercession is one of them. But intercession can also be a gift from the Spirit of God because intercession requires for you to be in God's face in prayer for hours on end. I cannot pray like that. My personality type will not allow me to stay in prayer for one hour, two hours, three hours. I can't. So what I do to compensate is I pray constantly. I pray constantly. I'm constantly praying. I'm constantly talking to the Lord. I'm constantly praying. I'm constantly praising. I'm constantly thanking because I cannot stay in one place for two hours. My personality type will not allow it. Okay? But some people can kneel down for three hours and pray for three hours. I know pastors in Nigeria who do it. It's a gift. And if you're gifted to spend hours in God's presence like that, relish it. Because not very many people can do it. All right? Deliverance. Deliverance, by definition, is the process through which God drives out illegal occupants, demons, from the lives of people, places, or things using his servants. That's my definition of deliverance. It's the process through which we cast out demons. In short, it's a gift from God. Not everybody can and not everybody does deliverance. Because for you to do deliverance, you've got to know what you're doing. It's like going into the den of a lion. 
you better have the God of Daniel with you to shut the lion's mouth. All right, because demons are evil, demons are vindictive, demons are wicked, and they will resist you. I once had a, 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 a very serious case in my ministry, a completely insane individual that God said to go minister to. They're restored to their right minds now. There are four people, completely insane, brought from the sanatorium that God has given us the grace to minister to, and they're normal, and they're in society today functioning normally through the power of the Holy Spirit and the process of deliverance. All right? I had occasion to minister to this family uh, many, many years ago. I want to say more than 15 years ago. Praise God. And I had occasion to minister to this family and um, the, la the, 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 the lady was also ill. So it wasn't just deliverance for casting out of demons, she was also physically ill. And I, I went to help to clean up her home and all of that. Um, and I, I did the dishes. And of course there was debris and all manner of stuff in, in the sink. So I cleared the sink and I walked over to the, uh, to the uh, trash can in the kitchen to empty uh, the, you know, the sink strainer. And there was a piece of nail, a small piece of nail that was sticking out the wall. And in my mind, I said, this is dangerous. It can, it can actually hurt someone who doesn't know that it's there. And I took a can of spray starch, which was stupid, and just gently tapped the nail. It was loose. I just gently tapped the nail. Next thing I heard, the can had been punctured. And the spray starch was coming out of it. So I ran back to the sink. Huge mistake. I ran back to the sink. The tap was running. Boom, an explosion. Because the, the H2 oxygen, I don't know the science of it, but the canister exploded in my face. And both my arms and my face was burnt. Guys, if I knew God was going to restore this beautiful face, I would have taken pictures. I was so vexed that the enemy attacked me that way through my own negligence. I didn't take any pictures. My entire face was burnt. My hair, all of it was singed to about this place. And it was an attack from the devil because I was ministering to this family. Okay, so deliverance is not something to be toyed with. I'm not trying to scare you. You may have the gift, and if you have it, more power to you. Just be diligent to study, be diligent to know what you're doing, and live a life as much as you can that's free from reproach so that the enemy does not have an inroad to attack you. But it's a gift, and we need more deliverance ministers in the church. When that level of holiness comes into the church, then people will be afraid to come into the church with, with the nonsense that they are doing in their private lives. Praise God. So it's a gift. It's the process by which God drives out demons from people, places, or things using any of his servants that he chooses to use. Okay? Craftsmanship. That's God giving you creativity unique creativity to solve humanity's problems. And my tight add, that's one of the fastest ways to become wealthy. If you can find answers to humanity's problems, you will become wealthy. Money will follow you. That's why I shared those four things that are greater than money. All right? You don't get money by working. You get seed by working. Your salary is a seed. That's why it's never enough. But leave that alone. We're not talking about money. Craftsmanship is God's creative ability in you to look at a situation and, and download from God solutions to those problems. I work in, in, in the construction industry. I'm not an engineer. I'm not, I'm not 
I didn't read anything. I'm not even a scientist. I'm completely arts. But I work with engineers and I solve engineering problems. Guys, only because I trust and I believe God for superior wisdom. I've been in the company of eight engineers who did not know how to fix a problem. I walked away from them and I asked God, I said, God, what do I do to correct this problem? To break the whole thing down will be too costly. And God told me exactly what to do. I went back and I did it. They came back to inspect and they couldn't tell what building it was of the 20 buildings that were standing. All right? So creativity. Creativity and innovation is gifts from God. That's how science and, and, and technology has gotten to where it is today. All right? Now, if the people in the world are able to download information from the realm of, the crea of, of, of creativity, what's wrong with us in the church? That we cannot, from our Father, who, to whom we have direct access, why can't we find answers to problem, problems? Okay? Craftsmanship goes alongside inventions, which, which is the next one. Of course, you have to be creative and you have to be somewhat scientific minded to be able to invent stuff. And I know God is going to, God is going to probably spank me when I get to heaven because he gave me an idea more than 20 years ago and I still haven't done anything with it. How to deal with, with, with uh, snow instead of the salt solution that, that you, know, you know the salt that they sprinkle? Uh, that the trucks go to sprinkle so that they can melt the, 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 the snow and the ice. God gave me a solution more than 20 years ago. I haven't done anything with it. And I pray that I don't die before I do. Because that would have been a waste. So inventions is a, is, a, is a spiritual gift as well. Music is also a spiritual gift. Although it's a talent, it's a gift. It's a gift. And music is very, very important because of the power of music. One day I'm going to teach on the power of praise for you to understand why we praise God and what praise does. All right? Music is powerful. If you've read the story of Dr. Ben Carson, he talks about the fact that he likes to play music while he's doing intricate brain surgeries. Okay? Music has been known to calm uh, people that are insane. Music is used in therapy. We saw that in the Bible. The Bible says an evil spirit would vex Saul, the king, not Paul, the apostle. Saul, the king in the Old Testament. There was an evil spirit that would vex him. And the people got together, his, his, uh, his, uh, his aides got together and said, listen, let's look for a minstrel. Let's look for someone who will play music so that... Th uh, Saul would be, would be calmed down. And so they looked for a minstrel, and guess who they found? They found David, the shepherd boy, the son of Jesse, who played the harp. And the Bible says whenever David would play the harp, the, the evil spirits in Saul will be quieted, and Saul will be normal. So music is powerful, and music is a gift from God. So know how you use music. You can create moves with music. If you listen to Sexual Healing by Marvin Gaye, what does it do to you? So be careful what you listen to. If you listen to Victory Belong to Jesus by Todd Dulaney, what does it do to you? Be careful what you listen to. Because your ears are gateways to your soul. Think about how you listen to a song or you hear a song and it sticks with you and you hum it all day. Praise God. So those are the 12 other general gifts that we find in scriptures that you can earnestly covet. The Bible allows spiritual covetousness. It says earnestly desire, earnestly covet spiritual gifts. Recognizing that we're first of all spirit, before we're flesh. This is just the house. It's useless. It's decaying every day. 
Don't bathe it. Don't brush your teeth. Then you'll know that it's decaying. Questions? I have to unmute you, right? Alrighty, you're all unmuted. I'll take questions or comments from what we've said. <clears throat> what do you think your gifts are? Where do you think God is most likely to use you? Well, I think I have plenty, Pastor Mo. That's for sure. Okay. But um, I think it's leadership, teaching. Um, I think those are like the main two, honestly. And um, right. I forgot which, there's one more, but I'm usually good with bringing in people into faith and stuff like that as well. Okay. Okay. So maybe there's an evangelist in the making. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. But what you then do, having recognized that leadership is one of them, teaching is one of them, the Bible says be diligent. So you got to pay the price. You got to read extensively. Leaders read. You were, teach, you were read. Doing, we were doing a training here in the Dominican Republic until 2 a.m. yesterday. That's and good. It was good. A lot of people left in there. A lot, a lot of people left in there feeling with a change of mind, you know, which is good. That's great. Anybody else? What are your gifts? Um, I think mine is encouragement and hospitality. Okay. And I, 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 like, I like to serve behind the scenes. But one good thing, I'm going to look for the book, I tried to order it, um, is I can't pray. <laughs> I am the one that throws arrow prayers. So like I'm constantly praying, I'm constantly praising, but staying in one place. And then sometimes I feel guilty, but, but having talked to you and then all the further reading I'm going to do, it makes me understand my personality uh, more. I can't stay in one place. It's very hard for me. I, I, can't. I can't do an office job. If you put me behind the desk, I'm going to die. There's, <laughs> there's, there's no question yeah. about that. No. no. So, Understanding your personality types helps you in, in understanding the workings of the giftings mm -hmm. of God in your life. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For me, Anybody I think else? hospitality. Okay. Who am I speaking to? Celeste. Celeste, okay. Hospitality. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. So you need to uh, speak to God about it. Tell him ways that... He, to show you ways that you can use it, ways that you can be effective in it. All right? Praise God. So Praise if you have the gift of hospitality, more than likely you have the gift of giving, uh, Romans chapter 12. You may also have the gift of mercy. Hello? Yes. Mm -hmm. Celeste, did you hear me? Yes, Romans chapter 12. Yes, we talked about the gift of mercy that God the Father gave. We talked about the gift of giving. So if you're, if you're given to hospitality, you're a giver because you're given out of what you have. You, you're allowing people to stay in your home uh, or there's a, a convention or a meeting that's being planned and you're volunteering to go bring people from the airport, settling them in the, in the hotel, being a, a protocol officer, and ensuring that your guests are well taken care of, that kind of stuff. Okay. So you more than likely also have subdominant gifts that's going to serve that dominant gift in your life. Okay. Anybody else? Pastor Ma, I have a quick question. Can, is it a gifting if your heart leans towards a particular group of people? Like for me, I have a special tenderness towards homeless people but I've never considered it as a gift. It's the gift of mercy. Okay. okay. It's just that you're drawn towards the homeless. Alright? Some people are drawn to motherless babies. Some people are drawn to the deaf. Okay. You know? <clears throat> so it's so I, Sorry. 
I'm sorry to cut you, but so when they ask me, I don't feel um, <laughs> drawn to other people's kids. And whenever they ask me whether I will work in the children's ministry, my body, so I shouldn't, I, I should stop feeling bad that that's, I should just, I said that that's not my gift. That's not your gift, but it okay. doesn't mean you cannot serve because yeah. we're all servants. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so you're in a church, uh, the, the children's church uh, teacher, is away on vacation or is ill, couldn't come to church, has a cold and doesn't want to pass it on to the kids. And pastor says, uh, Sister Sumbo, would you take the children's church today? Sure. You have children, so you know how to relate to children. And you should know how to teach children because you have children of your own. So that's not your area of gifting, but you can function in it. Okay. To, meet, to meet that need. Okay. Now, it's, it's when they try to force you, because I know churches where they say, if you bring your kids to the children's church, then you need to volunteer to teach in the children's church. That's wrong. In my opinion, that's wrong. All right? I bring my children to children's church because there are some people that God has gifted with reaching the minds of children. They, they just know how to, how to present the gospel to the children. If you put me in front of children, I'm a teacher, but I don't know how to teach children. There's a set skill to teaching children, just like there's a set skill to teaching adults. I'm too intense to teach children. See, but it doesn't mean if my church has a temporary need, I won't step up to meet that need and try to be as silly as I can with children. See, thank you. Nothing is cast in concrete. Okay. Because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. It's just yeah. that we come to the place of total fulfillment when we're actually functioning where he's placed us. Anybody else? There's several of you on the call. Surely you must have, uh, you must have been able to identify all the gifts that we talked about. All right, if no one else has any comments, let's wrap it up. Uh, I know many of you at work and are not in position to engage in a back and forth. Let us pray. Father, thank you for these two days of uh, divine interruption. <laughs> uh, we were studying uh, Genesis and the life of Joseph, but thank you, Lord. We have been refreshed. We have been reminded. Some of us have learned anew. And we thank you for the grace that's been made available to us. Um, now that we know, Father, we will be responsible with what you have given to us. Help us to find full expression and fulfillment of the gifts that you have given to us for the praise and for the glory of your name and for the furtherance of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for this fellowship. Thank you for what you're doing in us, with us, and through us. We pray for everyone that's present on this call. We pray for those who could not be on the call. Uh, we pray especially for our sister Bianca now, uh, who is <clears throat> studying, preparing for an examination. We decree and we declare in the name of Jesus that she has the mind of Christ. Thank you, Lord, that she, she calls to mind and she remembers everything that she has studied, everything that she has learned, everything that she has even heard that, Father, she's able to recall to mind. Thank you for clarity of thought. We pray especially that the Holy Spirit will guide her thoughts towards what she should read, what she should study. Father, you know all things, you see all things. You, you, you already see the examination and you see the, the result of it. Uh, you know what the questions are going to be. Father, we ask that you will reveal to her heart the areas that she needs to study so that she can be fully prepared. You said that you will give to us the desires of our hearts. That doesn't mean you give us what we desire. It only means you put your desires in, your, in our hearts so that we can follow after your will and your purpose and your counsel. We commit her into your hands. We rebuke every feeling and every thought and every attack of the enemy that may want to make her feel she's inadequate, she, she cannot pass. We rebuke that in the name of the Lord Jesus. We receive for her the spirit of excellence, 
the same that you put upon Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you put on Daniel, that you put on Joseph, that you put on Jesus, the spirit of excellence, on Paul, that we see, even in those of us today who have excelled in different areas of our lives. Father, we covet the same for our sister Bianca. We ask that you cause her to know joy concerning this examination and give her entrance into that particular college that she wants to go to. You said you're the one who opens doors that no man can shut. We ask that you open up the doors of that college of medicine to her. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. For every other person that's on this call, Father, we reach out and we touch their needs, be it in their body, be it in their family, be it at work, be it at school, whatever it is, we invite your presence into their lives and into their situation so that Jesus Christ will be Lord in every area of their lives. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. And everybody say, Amen. 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 Pastor Matt, we also want to pray for you that God has favor over you, Pastor Amen. Mo. Okay. Amen. And that He continue to bless you. Amen. Because you are a blessing to all of us. You have no idea. And Amen. just continue to pray for you and all your goals that He will reward you. He has rewarded you. Amen. Just want to thank you because you have really, you have no idea, Pastor Mo. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. God bless you. God bless you.